So I'm proud to welcome to the stage John Barnes. Hey, Yag Hitter Yun. And that's about it, Pack. <laughs> um, I, uh, yesterday I was feeling, so I do this quite a lot, but yesterday I was feeling really anxious. So I was trying to understand why do I feel so anxious? And it was because I thought, well, am I more serendipitous than anyone here? I'm not sure. So then I tried to think um, about that, and I came to the conclusion, the, the reason I care about talking about this so much is because I think I've experienced the moment in my life where serendipity had gone totally. So a couple of years ago, I got really sick, I had a really bad depression, and started to find life incredibly tough. Um, and it's natural that in those moments, serendipity seemed to not show up quite as much anymore. Um, my solution to that was to go walking a lot, like for days. So um, I went to Le Cami El Camino in northern Spain, which I recommend to anyone. It was totally, totally beautiful. I spent a lot of time in silence meditating, specifically 10 days in silence meditating. Um, and I tried a load of things to try and get my mojo back, basically. I felt like, um, I felt like my mojo had left me. So I did a lot of walking, a lot of thinking, and I spent a lot of time uh, with my really good friend Jim, who took this picture. So Jim and I are best pals. Um, we share a load in common, traveling being one of them. Um, but we're also business partners. So last year, we founded a company called Flux, where after years of helping organizations to build better cultures, to have more open and transparent organizations, to try and help corporates be self-managed or to make better products and services, recently we decided that um, maybe we should be using our skills for something different. Um, specifically, uh, we got pretty fed up with working with big companies. It's quite difficult to change a big company. It's quite difficult to help a big organization be really open and transparent. And so we decided that maybe we'd be better off putting our skills to helping smaller companies or to helping individuals who want to set up a company to benefit from all of the experience and expertise that we have. So we've been doing this for years for big companies, and now it's time to package that knowledge and to give it to, to the smaller guys. Um, and that's our new purpose. So we've got some new products out there. We've got the No Bullshit MBA. We've got Dream Hackers, which is to help uh, people launch their companies. So we did that recently in Albania and had someone uh, launch a rabbit farm. And he, t he texted Jim recently to say, the male rabbits are very tired. <laughs> we, we have service sprints where we help groups come up with new products and services. And one of our fam famous and favorite products is one called um, Founders Retreats. So every two months, Jim and I go on a Founders Retreat. We've been to the French mountains where we've used post-it notes in a slightly unusual way. We've spent time in a camper van in California. We've been for long walks in the countryside in Albania. So the Founders Retreats don't tend to have a really clear agenda. There are a few rules. No alarm clocks is rule number one. We wake up when our bodies are ready, when our bodies are ready, our minds are ready, and when our minds are ready, hopefully we'll do some really creative work. Spent, time spent in nature is a second rule. The more walking and time spent in nature, the better our ideas. We just make sure that we've got a laptop and some flip charts and post-its in our backpack in case we need to stop and package our idea and put it on the internet. We tend to divide our days between thoughts and things. Thinking, doing, thinking, doing. And that tends to be how we organize our founders' retreat. So in the past, we've published a book on a founders' retreat. We've uh, set up a new website, and recently we went to Portugal where we destroyed our company. So we decided after only six months that maybe it was time to stop helping huge, slow, boring organizations and to use all the knowledge we have to serve smaller companies. Um, so a lot happens on these founders retreats, but they're not done in the typical scenario. We're not doing it in uh, an office behind a desk 
or sat with post-it notes and a flip chart for days on end. Um, we try and do it in a different way. And the reason is because we think there's a new way of doing business. And core to that new way of doing business is having serendipity as a part of your strategy. So if you think of the idea that we'd spend nine to five days in offices and that that would be the biggest use of your creative abilities, there's plenty of science to say that that's not the case. Or if you think that companies have five-year plans, despite the fact that we don't know what's going to happen to the world in one year, let alone in five years. So we think there's new ways of working for commercial reasons that make a lot more sense, but also for our own reasons, for human reasons, that make a lot more sense. And that's what we're, we're trying to focus on. So I said serendipity is a strategy, which is often confused with luck. Um, I think the difference between luck and serendipity is that luck is a given. Luck is this slightly arrogant uh, cousin of serendipity. Luck like flaunts it in your face and wafts it around. Um, luck, is, luck is the fact that I was born with a lovely family and I'm white and middle class and well educated and straight and I've never been discriminated against in any way. That's luck. I have, I have no, uh, no pride in saying that I'm lucky. Serendipity, however, I think is something I can design. It's something I think I can create. A few years ago, a friend said to me, you're always so lucky. And I remember being so annoyed at that comment, because I was thinking, but you're, you're the same as me. What, what's the difference? Why am I lucky? And I think what he meant is, you have a high propensity for serendipity, John. <laughs> it's just a, quite a mouthful to say. So I define serendipity as this. It's the positive outcome resulting from the fostering of unexpected connections. So it has to have a positive outcome, and it comes from connections. Now, those connections can be plenty of things. It can be connections of neurons when I'm on a walk, and suddenly these two ideas that seem totally unrelated merge or clash or come together and help me to do something that I'd have never done before. Or it could be the connection between people, that moment where you meet a stranger and it just seems you have so much in common, or you learn something really amazing from them. Those are, I think, uh, moments of connections that create serendipity. And what I think is key to have is to nurture the environment within which those connections can happen. And specifically, I think, uh, big, boring businesses are places where serendipity can't occur. Yet, I think any entrepreneur or leader would say, that at points they got a bit lucky. At points in their careers, something good just seemed to happen. And so I think the, if we want to have uh, success, whatever that means to you, whether it's financial or gaining meaning in life, I think we need to foster environments where these connections can happen easily. We need to leave a little bit of room for them. And the key to that, I think, if I had to share one thing that I think is key to how we work and how, how I'd like to advocate working is to create time. So if you think of the idea, so here's an example. Recently, I spent, did a workshop with some clients, and they left really inspired. At the end of the day, they had ideas and strategies, and they're, they're like buzzing from this. And I'm like, great, let's stop. And I want everyone to just put one hour in their calendar next week so that you can really go and act upon these ideas and make them happen. And I just hear silence. <laughs> we don't have an hour next week. Oh, cool. Next, the week after then. Mm, booked up. So you're saying to me, for two weeks, there's literally not a spot in your calendar. So if there's not a spot in your calendar, there's no room for randomness. It means everything's planned. There's no room for a, a new person to come in and gift you with their knowledge or a different cultural perspective or or anything like that. There's no room for you to go and get your own space and think, or read a, a book, or find something new that will connect to these new ideas that you'd have. So without time, it's not possible to have serendipity. So if you're in that position, if I had one tip to give to you today, if you're in that position, I would stop, I'd breathe, and I'd delete something in your calendar, because you're doing too much. I think serendipity is about ease and energy, and it can't come when it's forced and planned and structured all the time. 
Um, and this is a, a mistake, I think, is, a, is symptomatic of the 21st century. It's almost a thing we brag about. How are you doing? Oh, I'm so busy. So busy. It's almost like a status symbol. I should have a badge saying I'm so busy. Which is where biz business comes from, right? Busyness. Which is why we try to talk about companies. Companies being people, places where I have companionship. Which is far more likely to encourage serendipity than busyness. So this, just to give you an example, this is Jim's calendar. You'll notice that it's, it's, reasonably, it's reasonably white as, as far as calendars go. So I think time is the most fundamental thing, and that's why if serendipity is the quality of connections that we experience times the quantity of ex connections we experience, I think time needs to be like power of two in our algorithm, in our source code for serendipity. So if you don't have time, I don't think you can get lucky. And that's something that we need to, we need to fight against our current systems or create space as much as we can. The second thing is what, uh, what in leadership models you'll hear about being an authentic leader. Um, I like to say getting real, because the opposite of getting real is being fake. Um, and no one wants to be fake. So if serendipity is about connections, I also want to attract the right kind of connections into my life, into my business, new collaborators. What I definitely don't want is to start encouraging the wrong connections. And a boss of mine put this really, really well. He said, when you go and apply for a job, there are four possible scenarios. The first one is you got the job, but you weren't yourself. Uh, wrong job. The second one is, you didn't get the job, and you weren't yourself. Well, you're an idiot, because you should have been yourself. You might have got the job. <laughs> then there's, I didn't get the job, but I was myself. And I'd congratulate you on missing out on an absolute disaster. And I see that with clients. When I've really been myself, and then I've, I've been like turned down, I've gone, oh, I'm so happy that happened. So the only possible situation that works is that you're yourself, whether you get the job or not. Um, and I think that goes the same for friends. I think it goes the same for clients, collaborators, anything we try and achieve. The expression, fake it till you make it, is nice, but I'd, I, th I think I'd far rather you be yourselves fully and the laws of attraction, whether commercial or in terms of the friendships that you nurture, uh, will be far more real and far more true to you. So that takes me on to the next point. Where, where, um, where do you spend your time? We've had time, so it's, it's sibling space is, a, is an important thing to go and nurture. So we're often told that we're in the creative economy or in the knowledge economy. Um, and I'd love to hear anyone who can raise their hand and say, I'm at my most creative when I'm behind the desk from nine to five, five days a week. <laughs> and then when I get on the underground for an hour, that's when I'm at my most creative. Said nobody ever. So if we're in a creative economy, it makes sense for purely commercial reasons that we make sure that we're creative. Whether uh, you're in the shower, I'm not advocating you shower all day long every day, but I hope you at least shower once a day. Um, whether you're, you're most creative when you're thinking on the bike, for me it's walking, Different people have different vibes, but what I'd really encourage you is that if you really want to be creative, which I think is the connection between different ideas, so serendipity is, is a part of the creative process. It can't occur without it. The, the place you spend your time is your decision as to how creative you, you are. My friend Rasmus likes to spend his time by the lake in Zurich. Recently, I went to see him. He did a little bit of work by the lake. I could see he was in a funny mood, and he, he like swam off onto the lake, onto this little pontoon. So I swam out and hung out with him. And we just chatted for like half an hour, an hour. And on that day, he made a really big business decision, a business decision that you couldn't make without the clarity of being with a good friend on a beautiful lake. <laughs> it's not the kind of clarity that you get in boardrooms, yet most decisions, big decisions that affect lots of people are made in boardrooms, the place where maybe people are the least real they ever are. So it's really important that we nurture this space. And it doesn't have to be nature. Our friend Krista here spends 
one month every year in New York, which is where he has all these serendipitous encounters. A camera is a beautiful way to invite someone into, into your world a little bit. And this is him meeting Kenny at the basketball courts uh, in New York. And, and from that has come, come a, a friendship and, and connections and ideas that you wouldn't otherwise have. So where you spend your time is absolutely vital. Another thing that I think is vital is that we pursue our ideas. So I think that requires a load of courage. Because if serendipity is the connection between different things or different ideas, you might already have those ideas, but there's this little gremlin in the back of your head that's like, that will never work. I don't think that will happen. This, that's not a good idea. People will laugh at me. Whatever that little gremlin is, I'd, I'd invite you to like give it a cuddle and then tell it to fuck off. Because <laughs> I think uh, you don't know if serendipity can't occur unless you pursue that idea just enough that other people and ideas can come and connect with it, even if in a small way. Energy can't come towards your ideas unless they're pursued somewhat. And I have a, I have a a small moment in the last year that helped me really, really realize this to, to a, a degree I'd not quite realized before, which is I was on one of my personal retreats, so I spent a week in Italy. I didn't really know why. I just wanted some, some time away from stuff. And I was in that restaurant at the back, bored, if I'm honest, <laughs> like a bit lonely, a bit bored. And it was around the time of the... Um, the EU referendum in the UK. And I was like, read a blog on my laptop and I was starting to get a bit angry about this. So I started writing a blog about how I thought democracy should be. And it, the blog was a bit long, it was about 6,000 words. So the next day I thought, I'll edit this down. It's too long. And I added to it, so it was 10,000 words. <laughs> so then I Googled, how long's a book? And her book is about 40,000, so I was like, okay, I'm a quarter of the way there. That's, that's not bad. I mean, I'll ask a few friends if I should pursue this idea. Um, and I chose people who were smart enough to criticize my idea, but kind enough to be nice to me. Um, and they were like cheerleaders for me. They were like, go on, yeah, yeah, go do that. And so uh, uh, about six months later, I'd written a book called Democracy Squared about how technology can hopefully create a, a more democratic democracy. Um, and I've got to meet people around the world, speaking or interviewing them or doing research. And I'm, I'm a part of this whole community that I didn't really know knew existed until I went and pursued that idea. So these connections, these friendships that I've now developed, I couldn't have had unless I pursued those ideas. So it's worth just for a moment, like putting that little gremlin aside, or even people who say, I, I don't think you should be writing about that. It's like, thank you, and fuck off. <laughs> and so that can only happen if we share openly. That couldn't happen unless you, you put that out there a little bit. We're, we're lucky because I think we have this spiritual technology called the internet, where if you share your vision early, the internet can tell you it's not a good idea. No one liked your picture. Or the internet can tell you this is awesome. That's a great idea. You should carry on with that. And there are plenty of examples now of businesses that instead of doing what corporates do, which is like six to 18 months of research, like theoretical research into whether this is a, a good market space to enter, to so just share your vision, your ideas, all the little ideas that are sitting inside you, to go and share them early. If you don't feel safe, then do it with friends around you. If you, do, if you start to feel safer, put it out to a broader audience. But if you put that out there, the energy that can come from that is huge. The validation that you can get for your idea is huge. And the serendipity and the people you might meet who might be able to help you. Going out and asking for help is, I think, one of the key, the key things that you can achieve creatively if you want to have a, a more serendipitous life. So I'd encourage you as much as possible to really nurture the idea of sharing openly. And that might be sometimes showing some vulnerability as well. We spoke about getting real. I think the only way to really have great connections is to do that by being slightly vulnerable. This is a blog post that Jim wrote recently 
called Eight Guidelines on Living a Mentally Healthy Life for the Mentally Healthy, where he basically says how much of a, an argument me and him had at work. But that seems to have been shared like so, so many times, and I think it's because he was able to, to show something that maybe, maybe is a bit scary to share. And so the number of connections and friends you can make from being so open is wonderful. And so that, that's one of my final points, which is the, the relationships we nurture. Um, now, as I'll tell you in a minute, I'm a minimalist. I like to have uh, my, my life empty as much as possible in some way, which also means that I'm slightly picky about my friends, <laughs> which, means that, uh, which means that sometimes I've decided that maybe I don't want to hang out with this person anymore. Because if I'm about nurturing serendipity, I need to nurture the right connections, whether that's for my own personal gain or just for my happiness and the joy that I want to get. So, so I've decided to spend less time with mood hoovers, as we call them, and, um, and more time with people who, who can share openly, who, are, who I feel wonderful around, or who I can contribute to and help them in some way. And I think these authentic, real relationships that we nurture, are super key to serendipity. All of these friends that have knowledge or support at the right time, or can connect you to other ideas or experiences, those are the kind of relationships that I think we need to nurture as much as possible if we want to get lucky. Uh, whether that, whatever that means for you, I think being, uh, it meaning getting happy is a pretty wonderful thing as well. So I think nurturing relationships is really important. And the last one is the one that is the sort of wrapper around this like, little algorithm of ours, which is to create space. I think it's common amongst all of the things that I've shared that we need to create space. Um, and I, mean, I don't mean space in terms of time or in terms of place, necessarily. I mean space in terms of how you feel and how you, how you live. A couple of years ago, I made the decision to get rid of everything I own, which is why uh, I look kind of similar on most things that you might see of me. Uh, it's mainly because I only own this jumper. But, uh, <laughs> but it's just, uh, I can't explain the amount of space and time and energy, mental space, that it's given me. Just not having to think about what I'm going to wear today is quite, a, is quite a wonderful thing. Only owning one drawer of, of stuff is, is like, an amazing feeling to have. But it doesn't have to mean that. It could be your relationship with technology. We're like wired to these things that are poking us all day long, which are serendipity machines when they're used well, but dangerous for serendipity when used badly. So if the first thing that you're doing in the morning is checking your phone, your day's already being chosen by, by the algorithm rather than by you. And if the last thing you do at night is to check your phone, your dreams have been hijacked and hacked as well. So trying to like minimize our use of technology, but use it intentionally and for the right purposes, is I think key to serendipity. Or it could be I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an, an absolute obsessive of napping. I try to, I try to nap every day. Um, and I think that's also super key for me, at least in my routine to creating the space I need for my ideas to flourish, for my friendships to flourish. I just need that little bit of, of me time. Or for some, it might be meditation. And for others, it might just be a walk or a coffee on their own. But creating that space is essential, because without that space, randomness can't enter our system. And without randomness, there's no connections. And without connections, there's no serendipity. So what I want to leave you with is the idea that there's a new way of working, and that way of working isn't premised on an obsession with growth. Uh, it's not premised uh, on an obsession with busyness and busyness and busyness. Um, it's not uh, an obsession with being proud that you work 50-hour weeks or back-to-back -back meetings. It's a way of working which I think uses serendipity, which understands that if we create space, we create value, we're able to be better versions of ourselves, we're able to do better work, we're able to attract the right things into our lives, into our companies. And that's when serendipity can occur, and that's where serendipity as a strategy can be incredibly valuable. Thanks. Okay.